Good morning, Crossroads Baptist Church and guests. We are thankful that you are with us via the internet or some form of technology. It's a tremendous blessing to be able to do this. Um, and we have learned a lot in a few days. Uh, I have anyway, I still don't know enough to pull it off by myself, um, but it's funner to have somebody to do it with anyway. So we're excited to be able to, to reach you this way. We are all, of course, cramped by the idea that we can't be together. And I've talked to a few people this week, and we really kind of had some plans going. And then we realized that everybody has somebody in their family that really doesn't need to get exposed to any outside stuff. So we backed off of that. We're doing our best to cooperate and keep the risk down for everybody that we can. Individually, we miss each and every one of you, the opportunity to see you and have fellowship with you in person. But we're praying that very soon we will be able to do that. So it's Saturday morning and I'm recording in advance of tomorrow where our normal service would take place at 1030. And I wanna make a few announcements. I know that you probably got an email from Tamara, but praise wise, Carla's daughter Aubrey is doing much better. Uh, she had the coronavirus. I'm not sure where exactly she lives, but she has rebounded from that. And thankfully, we've not heard from anybody that we personally know that has the coronavirus and specifically nobody within the church. That doesn't mean that there aren't other things, sicknesses and colds and allergy problems that are going around. So we're praying for you if you have those things going on. Also, our friend Kim Feld that sings with the New Floridians is having a thyroidectomy, I believe, on Tuesday. If you would be in prayer for her, I have heard that thyroid cancer is the best one to get if you, if you have to get one. But we all know what kind of power the word cancer has in our lives. And uh, Kim's a, a very good friend. She's a, a faithful Christian lady. Appreciate your prayer support for her. And I'm going to check and see what else is on this email that I don't miss. Uh, Wanda's granny was able to have her surgery yesterday to repair her hip. And it says that Mike and Claudia had to get a new air conditioner. And while we know the expense of that is painful, uh, being in this kind of heat is painful too. Uh, so praise the Lord they were able to get it. And we ask you to to praise the Lord also, Tamara was able to get some paper towels and toilet paper for people that were in need. And that's by way of the network that includes mostly church people. So we appreciate all your cooperation in those areas. Want to let you know again, if you need us for something, if you need us to bring you something or help put something together for you, please let us know. All right, I do have a message for you for tomorrow morning and we're just going to stay on track with our normal course uh, from first corinthians and we're going to finish chapter seven today i'd like to take a moment and pray and ask the lord to bless and again i encourage you to to watch the video and i'll remind you i heard from brother joe cassidy that they kind of put together themselves a little church service and that seems like a really good idea to me I know that we're all probably mood-wise and, and, and all we're a little bugged by all this social distancing and all that stuff. Um, some of us are pretty distant anyway, but we're trying to maintain everyone's health. And um, I'm thankful for the leadership from the president on down trying to deal with it. And I'm glad that we're not under some kind of a lockdown. I did have to go to a store yesterday, was able to see uh, Reuben for a moment and thankful for that opportunity. But let's pray and I will be praying for each of you and ask the Lord to answer your prayers for your family. Father in heaven, we thank you for this advantage that we have of uh, technology to be able to reach our people, even though we are separated by time and space now because of the rules that are in place and dealing with the virus. Father, we ask your hand of blessing and healing upon our entire nation and even on the world that this virus might be put down, that it might play itself out, 
and would no longer being, be being spread anywhere in the world. As long as it's out there and moving around, Lord, it could come back to us or to another country that's already been through it. And we ask that, that there would be a stop to it. We pray for our leaders to have wisdom and leadership from you. And Father, we pray that uh, they would lead in the best way possible. And may we as Christians set the tone for everyone to be cooperative and, and to put other people's needs before our own. Lord, we thank you for the answers to prayer that we read about just a moment ago. Thank you for the Gibson's air conditioner, for Aubrey Colbert doing better after having the coronavirus, for Wanda's granny being able to have her surgery done. And Lord, we pray also for Kim, who will be having surgery on Tuesday. Pray that that would be successful. There would be no lingering effects and no need for further treatments. We ask that you would bless in this reduced uh, church service that we'll have and in the message that we'll share. And I pray you would bless the Word of God, draw each and every one of us closer to you during this time where we have time that we wouldn't ordinarily have. We thank you for all your blessings upon us, and we thank you in advance for those that will come. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 27 through 30. I think verse 27 is an overlap. We stopped in 27 last week, and we'll pick it up in verse 27 this week. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 27 through 40. Uh, let's read now. Verse 27, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. That's a verse that a lot of people don't like to read when they read this section. They like to have something to accuse others of. The reality is this, that verse is in the Bible. I'm going to begin that verse again. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, you see that? If you've married, if you marry, you've not sinned. And if a virgin marry, that means someone who was previously unmarried. If they marry, they have not sinned either. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world is not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. I'll preach a message just titled this morning, Ready for the Challenges of Marriage. We've heard Paul describe some things and, and use words, um, similar words in the same context. We've heard him use uh, contradictory words as a matter of comparison and contrast as well. Understand a lot of planning goes into a wedding, but a lot of planning needs to go into a marriage. 
They say that men go into a marriage thinking it's the end of something, while women go into a marriage thinking it's the beginning of something. But in reality, we can spend way too much preparation time on a wedding and not nearly enough on a marriage. A wedding is a day, but a marriage is a lifetime. And in a lifetime of marriage, there, there are some real negatives to endure. Even from the vows, we, we have these, sickness and health, poverty and riches, plenty and little, family and in-laws, and the relationship just with each other. And I know what it's like to be in love, and, and I know what it's like to look for in marriage, but when you begin to take up residence in the same house, some things change. You might find you were harder to live with than you knew. And you may be grateful to your mother and father for having put up with you. You may find that the, the spouse that you've chosen is harder to live with than you would have imagined. Because in dating and in courting sometimes, we see the best of someone. But in marriage, we're going to see all of it. We're going to see the good and the bad, the rich and poor, the sick and health. The pressures of marriage themselves are some real negatives that must be endured. In verse 26, Paul mentions distress, the pressures of marriage. You have the pressure, pressures of progress, uh, a maturing love, and a matching life to go forward. And, and there's pressure in that. It, we, we have to behave differently. We have to grow as individuals in order to get along with someone and love them like we should and treat them like we should as Christian people. So progress is one of the pressures of marriage. Another is providing. It's not always easy to provide. And some people may be finding out right now there are industries that are shut down completely. There are other segments that are on reduced hours and reduced pay and everything else. Right now is maybe one of the difficult times to provide for your wife and provide for your home. Then, then thirdly, there are some promises. Promises. Remember when we get married in a formal ceremony or a wedding, we, there's a lot of talk about the vows. That's V-O-W-S, the vows. That's where we stand up before God and the people who came to see us wed and we promise some things. And we enter in with those promises in good faith. But sometimes they can be forgotten out of mind and we may not treat someone as wonderfully as we have promised to. We may not be as easy to get along with as we had promised to and vice versa. So there are the pressures of marriage that are some real negatives to endure. Secondly, there are some problems of marriage that are some real negatives to, to endure as well. In verse 28, Paul said, such will have trouble in the flesh. Now the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride cometh contention. And I know I've heard in my life about this person being humble and this person being proud. I believe pride is like a lion. Everybody has some. Everybody's told some lies they didn't have to be trained to. It was already part of their nature. And everybody has some pride. Everybody has some pride about some things they're not willing to give much ground on. We have pride about things that we think the other person should be willing to give much more ground on. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. That means that if one person is, is acting in pride and the other person is in complete humility, that there can still be contention. But that's not often the case. Usually there is pride on both sides, whether it's husband and wife, mother and father, employer and employee, whatever the case, in every relationship, pride exists. Pride can only be dealt with by surrendering our will to the will of God. And we must remember, if we've gotten married in the will of God, then we have in the will of God promised to do some things that we need to be doing. We need to be fulfilling our vows. Pride is a, is a problem of marriage that, that's a negative to endure sometimes. Then there's practice. I'll put this this way. When I got married, I had never been married before. 
I had never been a husband. I had never had the, all the good and bad things that come with being married around the clock. Well, my wife had never been married either. She was brand new, and I was brand new to this experience at the same time. And day by day, we learn a little. We learn some things we're glad to learn. We learn some other things we wish we didn't have to learn. We need God in our marriages. We need the blessing of God and a commitment to the Lord. And we didn't have that day one. And there came a time in our marriage when we said, hey, we're going to honor God with our marriage. You said, boy, I bet it got easier. Well, you'd be wrong. It got harder because every time that, that you vow to follow God, boy, the devil's going to take up your case. He's going to go to work outside you and inside you to bring up problems. So being married, it's a wonderful thing. The Bible says, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. Amen? It is a good thing. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. While it's a good thing, sometimes the daily practice of it is difficult. It puts some, some pressure and some, there's some negatives that go with that. There's pride. There's the practice of being married. But there's also plans. When I got well, when Tamara and I first started about getting married, started talking about it and planning about it, I told her, by the time I'm 35, we'll be driving matching 911s. Well, there was a lot of stuff got in the way of that. There were some ups and downs within the business that I worked in. Then I find out over the years that even though we spent plenty of money and we lived maybe higher than we should, we big-timed it a little bit, I didn't love the idea of owing a ton of money for a couple of cars. I don't think Tamara even ever would have wanted a 911. I certainly wanted one at one time. But like some have said, it's sometimes it's better to want that than to have that. But our plans must be prayed over to begin with. We must pray and ask the Lord's will, seek His direction and His leadership. But then if we get leadership from the Lord, we still have to prepare in order to bring those plans to, to pass. And then thirdly, we have to meet the need. We have to meet the financial obligations. So we have to provide for those plans as well. I was looking at something on a forum yesterday and they were talking about what a great time the virus has made this to buy a car, or truck or whatever. And I'm not sure that's ever true. But the reality is this, even though it's a good time, it may not be a good time for you or I to take advantage of it at this moment. So not only do we have to look at the overall condition about decisions, but we have to look at our personal condition. Are we in a position to sign our name, to pay cash for that vehicle, or to sign our name that we'll make so many payments for that vehicle? Because you've already promised that you're going to remain married. You've promised the Lord that you're going to keep yourselves from everyone else and keep yourself only to your wife or only to your husband. There are some real negatives to endure in marriage. That doesn't mean that it's not good. That doesn't mean that it cannot be great. But what you will find out is that there's enough hours in the week that there are going to be some things that come up. So first, there are some real negatives to endure. Secondly, there are some responsibilities necessary to execute. Paul says, when before somebody's married, they can live for the Lord. Well, I didn't know a lot of those people before they got married. I'll be honest with you. Most of the unmarried folks today are not thinking about how they can care for the things of the Lord. They're, they're thinking about how well they can feed themselves and how well they can entertain themselves and how well they can go through this thing called life with, with boyfriends, girlfriends, and all that stuff. And we live in an age now where people will put on an app things that would blow your mind and they will get together and behave like they're married with somebody they've never met. Now, I haven't always lived for the Lord. But that, that, didn't commute, that, that didn't compute in my mind before I got married. 
Uh, hey, I'm not going around looking to drink after everybody in town, coronavirus or no, right? So you better be careful about your interactions with people. And what happens when, when we start behaving like we're married to people when we're not, we find out we've got some competing possibilities. It's easy to get out of it. That's one reason so many people do it. But what happens in your heart and what happens in your soul is not easy to get rid of. So there's some responsibilities necessary to execute the cares of this life. Men, you have food, shelter, and clothing to provide just not for yourself, but also for your wife and any children that are produced by the marriage. You've got a future to provide for. Here's one of those interesting sayings. If you don't pay attention, you'll miss it. A woman worries about the future until she has a husband. A man never worries about the future until he has a wife. That's another one of those things that, that people get into. You, you don't really see that. You're looking at it two different ways. A, a wife now has a husband to take care of her needs and to plan and pray and prepare for her future and provide for her future. But a husband now has two people to be thinking about. He has to be thinking about her wants and her preferences going forward as well. My family and I have talked about uh, buying a house, and, and that may be something that we can do in the near future, and it may not. I kind of want to live on a lake. I think Tamara and Abby both like the idea of that, but I think for them, they would surrender the lake for a pool in a moment. That's something I have to consider. That's something I have to think about. It's not just my wants and my desires. Yes, I have the ability to have an air-conditioned shop, right? But I've also got to take care of some other things for my wife. She needs a sewing room. She needs a nice kitchen. Abby will need a nice place to live when, when she's at home. And, and we'll have to think about what we'll do with our, our dogs and all our stuff. We have way too much stuff. We think about food, shelter, and clothing, and secondarily fun, um, future. We need to think about fun as well. Sometimes we don't put enough emphasis on that. We think that we can just have that as a byproduct of what we're doing. But I think you ought to plan for some fun as well. There's the cares of this life. Second to that, there are the commands of the Lord. We've got a command to be faithful to God and the marriage. I've known so many people over the years that would show me the pictures of their, their wife and their kids, and they would talk about their marriage and their home, and I've said this before. But at the same time, they're hitting on waitresses while you're having lunch. That's not faithful. To be engaged in anything outside of marriage like that is a lack of faithfulness. Some people say, well, it's just flirting. Flirting's dangerous. In the right response, it may stimulate something in you to seek to go further. The, the best opportunity you're ever going to have to say no is the first time temptation occurs, not to see how far down that road we can go. I am always going to preach against dalliances in marriage. I'm going to preach against adultery. I'm going to preach against flirting. It's wrong. It's wrong to your husband. It's wrong to your wife, no matter which way it goes. We have to be faithful. That's my responsibility. That's not something I choose in the moment. That's something that I have to make up my mind about in advance. Speaking of that, I was talking to Brother Mike Blair from Baptist Church in Lake Wales, and he told me about this guy he met at a fellowship. He's a Hiles Anderson graduate. And the, this pastor had shared with Brother Mike some um, discipleship material, book, I think. And he was telling Brother Mike that he's seen some real good progress with it. And he had this guy that got saved and, and he got baptized and he became somewhat faithful to church. And, and part of his normal Saturday night stuff is he would call this guy, remind him about church, encourage him to be faithful to church. And then he said as they got further on in the, in the discipleship material, he was working with him on a weekly basis, he said, out of the blue, this guy called him and said, Preacher, 
you don't have to call me anymore. You, you don't have to tell me I need to be in church on Sunday. My wife and I have committed we're going to be there. We'll be there, and we'll be on time. Matter of fact, if you have people you'd like me to call for you and encourage them to be there, I'll do that. That's the kind of goal-oriented growth that every pastor and every church is looking for. By the way, beyond the pastor and the church, there are, there are people in leadership roles throughout the church. They're looking for that same kind of thing as well. It's encouraging. By the way, husband, your wife would be encouraged if she didn't have to worry about some things out of you on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. If you just make up your mind, you've already committed, you're already commanded, you may as well commit your own heart to be faithful. Same thing is true for the ladies. There's faithfulness to consider. There's fellowship. Well, we got to be in fellowship with God and each other. But there's a third leg of that triangle in marriage. There's my faithfulness to God in the marriage. There's my wife's faithfulness to God in the marriage. But there's our faithfulness as a couple to God in the marriage as well. We need fellowship with one another. We need the right fellowship not the wrong fellowship. By the way, people trying to use spiritual language, they'll sometimes say, my wife and I were having some intense fellowship last night. That's a fight. Amen? That's not something else. That's arguing and fussing and fighting. We need the right kind of fellowship. We need that sweet and easy fellowship between us. But we need fellowship as well. We need faithfulness. We need our fellowship, but we need to think about our fellowship Gentlemen, it is up to you to follow the Lord's will. And as long as you are following the Lord's will, it's up to your wife to follow you. So give them something to follow. I've known people in song leading that they'll stop in the middle and put their hand around their ear, cup their hand, if you will, around their ear, and intimating to the church that they're not singing loud enough. The reality is this. If you're supposed to lead them, then you better give them something to follow. So there's some real negatives to endure in marriage. This must be considered in the early going. Secondly, there are some responsibilities that are necessary to execute. And then thirdly, this is a bit repetitive out of the last few weeks, there's a representative nature to express. A under that would be the love of Christ for the church. Gentlemen, the Bible says that we are commanded to love our wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, how did Christ love us and give himself for us? Well, A would be freely, or one under that would be freely. He loved us freely and gave himself for us freely. When God spoke to Adam, he said, Of the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But when Eve responded to Satan, she said, we may eat. She left out the word freely. Didn't cost him a thing. Christ's life, love for us doesn't cost us a thing either. He not only loved us freely, he loved us fully. Are you listening? All the love we needed, he had in store for us in advance, which included him going to a cross and dying in our place after he had fulfilled the law of God on our behalf. He loved us freely, and he loved us fully. Thirdly, he loved us forever. He present tense does love us, and future present tense will love us forever. That's how we're supposed to love our wives, just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, freely, fully, and forever. So, there's a representative nature to express, and that's the love of Christ for the church. That love of Christ for his church, gentlemen, needs to be evident in realistically and ideally from both partners, the one to the other. But secondly, not only is there the love of Christ for the church, there's the love of the church for Christ to be represented as well. As the church, we are to love Christ sincerely. You know, I've said this many times. People that say, oh, I just love the Lord, and they're happy and almost ridiculously so about it. 
the reality is you never see them with a Bible, you never see them in church. If a man loves his wife freely, fully, and forever, she'll know it. And it's incumbent upon us to show it in a way that she can understand it, in a way that she can receive it. By the same token, we're to love Christ sincerely, not just in word, but in duty and in discipline. We're to love Him sincerely, but we're to love Him singly. How do we love Christ? Differently and more than we love anything and everything else in the world. There's to be a single nature to the love that the church has for the Lord Jesus Christ. And our marriage needs to represent that. And wives, this would be the direct comparison to the wife's role in the marriage. The church representing the bride of Christ. Thirdly, not only are we to love Christ sincerely and singly, but we are to love Christ spiritually as an outgrowth of Christ's love for us. The Bible says in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the first word mentioned in the fruit of the Spirit. So if we do have a spiritual life and a relationship with Christ, we will love Him from a spiritual point of view as a fruit or an outgrowth or a product of the Spirit of God in our life. We will love Christ and men and ladies. If we have a spiritual life and are in relationship with Christ, we as an outgrowth, as a product of the fruit of the Spirit, will love our wife or our husband the same way. The Bible says also in 1 John 4, 19, we love Him because He first loved us. We must first experience His love in order to express or extend His love back to Him or to anybody else, particularly our spouse. So while we're looking at this huge chapter, uh, 40 verses, every one of them having something to do with marriage, either preparation or the practice or the progression of marriage, there's some challenges that we have to take into account. We would do well to take them into account in advance for those that may be preparing for marriage or those that may be hoping for marriage. There's something to plan for besides a wedding. By the way, I have an app uh, that I signed into at one point. And it'll contact me. It sends me a text and an email, which is a redundancy I don't need. But it will, it's called FASH, F-A-S-H. I assume it stands for fashion. And people will, they're looking for an officiant. Number one, I'm not that. I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. And many of them will say, no mention of God whatsoever. Well, they don't want me for sure. And I don't want them for sure either. But the reality is this. If God's not in that thing from the get-go, there's going to be a problem. It's going to be difficult to get it under His heading at some point. Not because He will resist it, but because your flesh and the experience of your life will cause you to resist it. I encourage everyone to make up your mind in, in love and in faithfulness, no matter what. If you never have dedicated your marriage to God, you need to do that today at an invitation time. There are some challenges in marriage, some real negatives to endure, but, but there are some responsibilities that are necessary to execute. Thirdly, remember, there's a representative nature of your marriage to express. And that's the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ to His church and His church to Him. I pray for your marriages often, and I'm going to pray for your marriage now in just a moment. But I'd like to say at the close of this service, like everyone, if you're here today or you're watching us via your computer or your phone or tablet, and you know not the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, we are all sinners and sin has a price, and that price is death physically, which we'll all eventually experience, but it is a spiritual death as well. It is the absence of God in our life that Adam and Eve were created with, but after they sinned, they lost 
the image of God. And the image of God is not something we can create. It's not something we can fake. It's not something we can contrive on our own. The image of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that He is the express image of the person of God. And unless and until we receive Him by faith, that image is lacking. And it is a hole in our lives that can only be filled by Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. If you've never been saved by the grace of God through faith which is in Christ Jesus, I encourage you as an act of your own will to receive Jesus Christ by faith. You say, well, preacher, how could we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because all you have to do is from the Word of God. In Romans 10, the Bible tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Condition on the idea that his death was only precipitated by his dying in our place to pay for our sins. If you believe that he died in your place to pay for your sins and you will receive him by faith and confess him with your mouth, the Bible follows in the next verse and says, for with the mouth, I'm sorry, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And it goes on to say just a couple verses later, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if today from your heart to God's heart, if you would call upon His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save you, He will, if you will believe that God raised Him from the dead, after he died on a Roman cross to pay for your sins, and you will receive him into yourself as your Savior. He will come into you, and he will save you, and you will be saved forever by, as a condition of what you believe and then confess. If you've never been saved, I would encourage you to do that today. Church, we love you, and we're going to pray now to close this service. We're going to take a moment and pray for your marriages as well. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity to take up the Word of God again. And Lord, the, the idea of marriage can be seen, hey, this is just something we've got to preach through. But it is a delight to preach it because we know that marriage is important to you. Father, for every couple that is a member of Crossroads Baptist Church, for every couple that, that, that attends for every couple we know, Father, we pray that your hand of blessing and power might be upon their marriage, that you would lead them to correct everything that is wrong and everything that is lacking, and that you might find the number one place in their marriage, that you might be a benefit to them in their marriage. Father, now if someone is here listening without Christ, I would encourage them the best way they can to say something like, Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and that my sin requires death and after death the lake of fire. But I know, I learned today that Jesus Christ paid for my sins and he died under the penalty of my sins. I receive him as my Savior and call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save me now and I'm placing my faith and trust in him and his shed blood to save me. Lord, I pray you'd lead some to pray that prayer even now. I pray you would bless our church. Lord, this being separated as a result of this virus is difficult for each and every one of us. I miss our people. I miss the fellowship of being together assembled in the church. But I pray you'd bless every individual and every family. And Lord, I ask you'd now close us in your grace. We love you. And thank you for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here today. God bless you.